Okay, and then one other thing, we won't have class next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is actually Shavuot, so we'll be in shul. So I won't see you next Tuesday, but I'll see you the following Tuesday. So I'll look forward to seeing you then after this week. All right, so we are in a beautiful convergence of time on our calendar and the Torah. You know, so many times we're, we read about the Exodus from Egypt, we read in January. We read about, you know, all these things are never happening at the same time that we're actually experiencing them, except for today. So tonight begins Rosh Chodesh Sivan, and the Torah reading is the Torah reading of, oh wait, what I just said is totally wrong. Scratch that. Etta, yes, question. Oh, just a question about... You said we can add other people's learning. Can I include my husband's? Yes, absolutely. This is not just, this is not just, um, <laughs> yes. Family, it could be a family thing. Yes, okay. it, could, it could be children also. If you're reading a Jewish book to grandchildren or nieces or nephews, you may count that time. This does not mean that you have to be sitting down with a page of Talmud and Rashi. This could be, I'm reading a book about how to be a nice person to my bubby. You know, it could be anything that would be Jewish learning. Okay. All right. So we are um, the, the Jewish people, what I just said before, scratch that. That's not what I meant to say. This, what we are going to do is starting tonight is Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Rosh Chodesh Sivan is when the Jewish people arrived at Mount Sinai and they encamped there. And what we're going to talk about is the encampment of the Jewish people, because that is what we are starting now with the book of Bamidbar. This encampment, this is so funny, it's called numbers in English. It's like, how boring is that? I mean, even if you're a number cruncher kind of a person, I'm not sure you'd like want to really sit down with a story like, and now I'm going to read you the book of numbers. It's like, call me when it's over. Okay, so it's like, why would I do this? It's like, what are these books? of numbers the numbers is the census the numbers of the jewish people being counted um the kind of like the fighting army group between the ages of 20 and 60 this is how we arrive at knowing how many people were actually in the desert that if there were 600,000 about of men between the ages of 20 and 60 then there were probably at least 600,000 women between the ages of 20 and 60 that gives you 1.2 million and then you add in the children below the age of 20 and the people over the age of 60 and the, the estimate is close to 3 million people. So that's how we understand, not like in the movies where it's like a ragtag bunch of people leaving Egypt. We're talking about a huge number of people. And this Parsha makes me cry with happiness. It's like, why is that? It's because the description of the encampment, why is that so special? says that the Jewish people were told by God through Moshe how to encamp around the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary. And number one, everyone agreed to do it. No one argued about which tribe they were going to be living next to. Nobody argued about which side of the Mishkan they were on. They didn't say, well, I wanted the seat by the door. I wanted the seat by the, by the speaker. It was like, I'll wear Wherever you say I'm supposed to be, that's where I'm supposed to be. And everyone was under their households, their, their tribe's flag. And everybody just did it. And everybody was happy being who they were, the individuality, the individualism, but in the context of community. This Parsha is actually the ideal map for how to have a successful society. And nobody has yet figured it out. Nobody has figured it out. It either goes toward rugged, rugged individualism, everybody do their own thing, or everybody subsume and relinquish their individuality for the sake of the nation and has not quite figured out how you get people to be individualists and individualized and celebrate differences with a united centralizing force around which everybody can contribute their collective and different energies. Hasn't figured it out yet, but that is actually the ideal. So if you want a map of society, you want this Parsha of Bamidbar. 
and everybody was formed. And the way they were formed was also fascinating because it wasn't in a circle, it wasn't random, it was in a square. So I don't know how, if anybody struggles, I don't wanna use the word OCD lightly because I know there are people who really struggle with this, but people do use it kind of as a, well, that's so OCD. But if you imagine going camping with a bunch of friends and you said, okay, we're gonna all put our tents in a square you know, and you go on this line, you go on this line, you go on that line, you go on that line, they would think you were, there was something wrong with you. Okay, now if you're in the military, if you're the Roman legions, they still, you can see by standing at the top of Masada, you can look down and you can still see the remains of the Roman legions of their encampment at the base of Masada. And it's very linear. But no, nobody does that when you're traveling with three and a half million men, women, and children. That's just not a concept. It's like, who even does that? And yet that was the Jewish people because the Jewish people were being formed as a nation and as a force. You know, in the Chabad, it's called the, um, the Tzava, you know, like the army, the army of God, which sounds a little weird to us. It sounds like Salvation Army, but like the army of God. This is a nation that is dedicated to the service of Hashem, men, women, and children of all ages, of all varieties, of all skills, all personalities, all everything. And they were in a formation that spoke to that. And they all did it. Now we know the beautiful Jewish people, if they would have been complaining or whining about this, we would have heard about it because we hear about all the other whining and complaining. And there was no whining or complaining. Everybody went into their place and celebrated who they were. So a lot of interesting things come from this. How many of you are familiar with the term minhag? Like a minhag, a family minhag? Does anybody have a family minhag that you know of? I know we all think we're normal until we find out that somebody else doesn't do that. So anybody have any minhagim that uh, their family does for anything? A holiday, a Passover minhag, uh, something minhag. And I don't mean a superstitious kind of minhag. I mean like a minhag minhag. Does anybody have? a thing that they know of. You may have something that you don't even realize is a minhag. Do you have anything? Lisa, do you have something? I'll share. Well, it's not me, but we were at Shabbat dinner with, do you remember Rabbi Zev and Alana Pomerantz? Yes. We were at their house for Shabbat and they asked Sandy to um, lead the benching. But Sandy, what was that part? And we're, benching along and then there came a part they, do the they oh come here so I share this story because it was very interesting so I'm bringing Hi. my husband in hey Sandy so um we were they asked me to lead the benching and so I was leading the benching and singing the different parts of the um you know of the paragraphs and we get to the part of harachamon and dead silence they they, they say nothing at the table Okay. And I said to them, you left me hanging here with harachamans. And they said, it's their minhag that on Shabbos, they don't say harachaman during benchings because it's asked, it's a request. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you could have told me that before. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I thought, they said, well, we don't, it's not a big minhag. We, you know, it's, it's not a popular minhag with, with a lot of people, but that they, they don't do requests on Shabbos. That's so interesting. Thank you, Sandy, for filling that in for us. Well, I was trying to remember the part. Okay, thank you. That was it. <laughs> so there's all these different things like we don't ask, we do ask. Some people don't do the last verse of Shalom Aleichem. There's all these different things. There's even things about pronunciation. Have you ever gone as different people, depending on where they came from in Europe, they say things a certain way? Do you know all of that is supposed to be preserved? It is not supposed to be a melting pot of like, just like make everything, um, of making everything, you know, just do, making everything homogeneous. The goal is not to homogenize. The goal is to preserve the differences and a person is supposed to preserve the minhagim, the customs of their family. And it comes from this thing with the tribes that you go under your family banner. So that happens like, like with a, a if, let's say there's a woman who is from a Sparty background and she marries somebody from an Ashkenazi background. So it does go by the man. 
because otherwise it, then it's just a power struggle. So there has to be some sort of a system. So it goes by the father, just like the tribe goes by the fi father, the minha goes by the father and the family becomes a, the family becomes whatever the father is. And it would go the vice versa if it was Sparty and Ashkenazi. So all of these things, like why do we make such a big deal about preserving them? It's the same thing like where we don't have like mixing species of animals. It's like things are supposed to retain their unique qualities and that that's beautiful and we appreciate it and we need everybody's contribution by who they are, not that they turn into just one bland thing. It's like gray is not the option. Leslie. Um, I think that's what most of us do with our um, Seder recipes. They're they're family recipes um, that, you know, that that my mother made or my grandmother made or both of them. And um, and that's some of that's the only time of year I make them, but that's our family that's uh, right. custom. That's the same right. thing with what you call grandma and grandpa. In my family, I'm a Baba. Uh -huh. I'm not Booby, I'm I'm Baba. And um, and my great grandparents were Baba and Zaida. So it's from that wherever they were from in Europe, that's what it was called. And that and, they, and that's that's beautiful. And that's not just considered nostalgic, that's considered essential. That's considered that we want to preserve this because it has, it's like the world needs it. It's an it's an essential ingredient in the whole package that we don't want all these things, these differences to disappear. Now, if somebody wasn't raised with anything, then they can choose a minhag, they can start a new minhag, but it says unless the minhag was to do something that goes against Jewish law, that you, your minhag can't be, I have a pork sandwich on Pesach. If that's your minhag, you can bag that right now. But it, anything short of a halachic problem, it says like the minhag is really important. So it's interesting to think about. So like my family, it's a very simple thing. I grew up with um, celery for the Bore Priyadama, for the um, Karpas at the Seder, and Steve's family was parsley. So now we do do both because there are some things you can do both. We can have parsley and celery. So whatever it is, all these things, so just like to even to think about during this week of what have we inherited from our relatives of things that we carry down that are precious so we know that they do all these studies, like our children and grandchildren or nieces or nephews, they don't, it says, nobody wants brown furniture. All these people say like, I'm saving this for my kids. It's like, don't save it. The next generation doesn't want it. They do not want it. But minhagim don't take up any room, okay? So maybe they don't want your furniture or they don't want your you know, set of sterling silver because who in God's name wants to polish it? But they might treasure and would, be beneficial to treasure a family minhag or a custom. And that this is something that is, is really important. And it goes back to this Parsha of being able to identify the people by their families, by their tribe, how you say things, what you do, all of these things are really considered important. So again, it is a beautiful thing because when it's sometimes people say, oh, we really value differences. They don't really mean it. They mean we value differences as long as it's something I like. Um, and if I don't like it, then I don't value it. But this means like we do value it. And the different tribes were very, very different personalities and very different inclinations and different everything. And we have that embedded in the religious structure. So every tribe had a different precious stone on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. Every tribe had a certain place where they were in the lineup on which side they were on. Every tribe had a flag that was unique and distinctive for them. And yet they all had something. There was never a goal of like, let's just have one flag, one people, no more tribes. Let's just be one nation. Let's not, we don't, we're not doing Euro. You know, Euro, that's not a concept. That's not gonna work. The idea is to have the variety, but to have a variety that somehow focuses on an overriding meta goal. And the meta goal is serving Hashem and following the Torah. And if you have that as a, as a magnetic force that holds everything together, then all these differences work. 
if there is not something holding everything together, those differences only eat away and cause problems. It's like in an organization, in a business, if there isn't like a mission statement that's holding the whole thing together, then it's just power struggles and politics and, and whoever can yell and scream the loudest. That's what it turns into. So without the, but the centralizing force holds it all together. So that's our goal. So that's why it's like, like, oh my gosh, this is like utopia here in the Parsha of Bamidbar. So the other thing, um, the other thing that I appreciate about this is the encampment is also the on the ground version of our calendar. It's the on the ground version of the Jewish calendar. So when it starts, it says each of the 12 tribes is associated with one of the Hebrew months. And we've done this in the past where we've talked about what the different months are. Some of us on here have done the whole book of, the, of each of the, the months and the tribes and all of these different things. And the, these, the 12 people, so just as much as every month has its place on the calendar, so too every tribe has its place in the encampment and in the world. And to mess up one is to mess up the other. So all time is not equal and all space isn't equal, or, I'm sorry, isn't the same and all people are not the same. We're all equal in respect, but we are not the same and to be able to value that. So we are going to be launching the Rosh Chodesh of Sivan tonight launching this new month. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about another piece of what this is related to. So each of the Hebrew months is also related to what's called a spiritual quality. And the spiritual quality that we started off with in the month of Nisan was the spiritual quality called um, speech, okay? Speech, talking, our speech. And that really, that really adds up for us because the main holiday for the month of Nisan is Pesach. And the main mitzvah, the mitzvah of Pesach is Vehigadata Levincha, and you shall tell your children. And whoever is expounds on it, Harezem Meshubach. Behold, that, that is praiseworthy. So speech is the quality of the month. The next month of ER, which we are now completing, that was the month of thought, the month of thought. So we're completing, thinking. If you think about it, that has more to do with the counting of the Omer, Sfirata Omer. Nobody made a Seder. Nobody was talking necessarily. You say a little short blessing, that's all you're doing. It was all about what's going on in here. What are our thoughts? How are we elevating our thoughts? How are we kind of gearing up? And nobody was necessarily seeing anything. And then we get to the month of Nisan. And the month of Nisan is the quality of action in the form of walking. So it means to go, go. So what, what interests me is the triad of those three things, of speech, thought, and action. Is that how we would really think that that's how it works? Is that the order, like how we do things? I mean, we tend to think of like, I don't know who, does anybody have a different pattern that we normally think of? Like, how do we do stuff usually? Or how do we think we're doing things? Leslie? Well, usually we hope that we're thinking before we're talking. Uh, okay, before thinking we're before moving. we're talking. And then, and, and then where is action in that? In after, the, after, after that. After that, okay. So we'd like to think that we're thinking before we're talking. And in, in truth, one should think before they talk. If one is trying to change how one thinks, this is the key. So one changes. Yes, Daisy, please. So how does this compute with Na'aseh and Ishma? Uh, okay. Thank you. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Okay, so this, this has to do more with not observance of Torah, but of transformation. How does one change oneself? Does one try to change one's thoughts first or what? And the Jewish approach is first talk it. First, our speech creates our thoughts. 
our speech creates our thoughts. So yes, we should think before we speak, but the way we speak influences the way we think. So that if somebody is trying, and because thoughts are actually very challenging to grab a hold of, have you tried to manage your thoughts? It's like, you know, they talk about herding cats, managing your thoughts and controlling your thoughts, not so easy. Managing your speech, that what actually comes out, someone can choose language to say and to talk about and how to articulate, how to talk about things changes our thoughts about what we have said words about, and then will therefore change our actions because it's as if we have reprogrammed ourselves through speech. So we think we should change our thoughts first, but we do it and Daisy probably knows more than anybody, anybody else here is a therapist. If you're trying to get somebody to change their thought pattern, you must have them first speak it out and to get to a place of how they can say something differently about what it is they are thinking about because it thoughts are a very difficult thing to get to directly. They need an indirect approach. Daisy, do you have anything to no, add there? I agree. So that this is a beautiful thing. Thank God. Thank God we have this mechanism so that when we are talking about how can I think about something different, first try talking to yourself about it differently. That when we talk to ourselves differently about something, the way we describe something, um, you know, we even um, in our book, Living in the Present Moment, we talk about language that we can use to help us live in a place in the present moment with joy and happiness, just the words we use to describe what is happening. So if I say that something is very bitter or painful or difficult or challenging, that those are different words that are going to lead, lead to different thoughts than if I say it's bad. Once I have made a judgment about something, I'm going to have one thought pattern. When I say other words, I can change my thought pattern and therefore my action. I've been feeling uh, very frustrated about what's going on um, around the world, just pick a place, any place, and feeling like, oh, I don't have any control. I don't have any control. I don't have any control. And like, you just wrote a book about how we don't have control. So like, why are you even using that word? That word is already a trap. So the question is, how do I change my conversation with myself? Moving from control to manage. Because manage comes from the word mano, meaning hand. Like to manipulate is something that is in your hands to do. It's like, what's in my, that, that gives me a different thought. Control isn't, that isn't even the right word. The word is manage. How, what is in my hands to manage? What is it that I can do? What do I, what am I able to manage? I can manage my time, my food, my household work, my conversations with people. That's what I can manage. The selection of the language alone redirects the thoughts in a different trajectory and then we'll gen bless you lisa and we'll then change the change the actions that come from that because the combination of the thoughts and the words is the impetus to the actions that are going to result from that any thoughts or words about that just language that is helpful to use I have my other favorite, which is predictions, making predictions. Human beings love to make predictions. I knew that was gonna happen. I could have told you that. I told you so. I saw that coming, all that stuff. We just love, love, love that because it makes us feel in control. And even if it's horrible, we'd love to be right about predictions. Um, so um, like, oh, this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. And instead of saying this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, that the other word is preparations. What preparations could I make for different scenarios? What, what, do I, what do I need to prepare? And that is already going to lead to a completely different mindset. My thoughts are already going to be different from a place of preparation than from a place of prediction. So the idea of having our words and speech 
influence our thoughts and then take us into the world of action. It's walking, but specifically action. And that is the month of Sivan when we get the Torah. So when we get to that place, then we are in a place where we really can do something. And then we get to exactly the question about na'asevenishma. Na'asevenishma, which means we will do it. And then nishma um, means really to learn and understand. Ah, uh, like you say, like, ah, shamati, like I hear you. So it means to be able to understand that first there comes action and then there comes a level of understanding because people sometimes want it to work the other way. First, explain the whole Torah to me. And then if I buy into it, maybe I'll do it. Instead of saying, no, try doing it. And as you do it, that will cause you to understand it. But there's only so much you can understand in theory. And then one has to do it. Um, it's like being in a perpetual, it's like, I'm going to look, teach me everything I need to know about flying a plane and then I'll fly one. It's like, no, you won't. You will be get behind uh, the, in the cockpit and behind the whatever wheel, whatever it's called. And you'll be learning it while you're there. So there's only so much you can do. And the Jewish people by saying, Na'asev and Ishma is like, just do it. And it's not a blind faith. It's the reality that some things are really only understood in the doing and through the doing. So that's not a seven ishma, the Jewish people standing at Mount Sinai and saying that. Etta. Yeah, I, I remember um, there was an old, old psychologist in the 1700s, and he would just get his people who are having troubles to just say, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. And he found a significant number of them improved in whatever problems they had. And he couldn't figure it out. They Their words changed their thoughts and then as you said their actions so words are powerful and what can we say you know first of all we're the people of the word second of all human beings that's the definition of our life force is it's called a medaber someone who speaks speaking creates realities we, we have all these things about lush and hara and not hurting people for words it's like this is not something to compartmentalize. Oh, only in certain circumstances are words important. They carry the same weight to myself. The language that I use in talking to myself about myself, about the world and everything else, I am creating my own reality. And with that go my thoughts and my actions will flow from that. So it's like, we're really a, we're all, uh, we're all creators in that way. And we create that reality. And it's frightening because we know people who are saying things to themselves about themselves and about their situations who have created a reality that's completely self-destructive or destructive of other people. And it's because of what, and they have created, you know, it's very common to say they've created a narrative. They have created a narrative about themselves and their life. And we're not talking about saying factual accuracy. We're talking about what is your interpretation of what it is you are experiencing and what your role is in it and where you stand in that story. And it's very, very powerful. So I've been thinking about this a lot because unfortunately what my um, anxiety leads me is just to eat spoonfuls of peanut butter and chocolate. Um, Cause so I was like, okay, now that's really stupid. So I'm upset with, I can't control the world. And how do I expect that that's gonna be helped by um, having peanut butter and chocolate? It's not really going to do that. So uh, like what is in my hand to control? Wash and check lettuce and have a salad. So I can do that. So this is all the inner workings of my little head. So this is, and I know that I'm not unique. So that's the good thing. So that when we have this, this triad is so instructive for us that it says, what's the order? What's the real order? The real order is speech, which leads to thoughts which leads to action. And to work on that pattern is incredibly transformative. And that that's our goal of what we are trying to do. Thoughts, questions, reflections, anything? Yes, Marty. But you're muted. There I am. It's interesting to me when you said that about um, the predictions and wanting to be right, 
do you think that's a universal trait or a trait of women everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> it's for sure a trait of, of, of mothers or caretakers. I told you, you know, I was like, you know, um, predictions are a way to stay safe. It is a, it's an artificial sense that one can stay safe if one can predict all of the horrible things that could happen. Uh, I know, you know, it's going to rain, it's going to be slippery, it's going to be this, it's going to be their monster, I, you know, you name it, and I can predict it for you. And then out of all of that, I'm bound to be right on one of those, and then I can, <laughs> can do that. So it's human, it's human nature, we want to be able to predict it is, it is a desire to be in control. It's the idea of being omniscient, and omnipotent is that if I can't, con if I can't actively control it, my ability to and my thought that I can predict it is the word predict means literally to pre say. I'm going to say in advance what is going to happen. That makes me, that gives me a sense of control and that I, I'm somehow I can in, in control. But it's a human thing. Um, I think, you know, not all mothers, but women, so like, that's not going to work out well, I can tell you that. And part of it is necessary. That's the other thing is all of these things have a good side to them. If somebody did not make any predictions whatsoever, they'd probably be in pretty bad shape. You have to be able to look at any given situation and think about what might be a reason for concern. But the only reason to do that is so that one can make preparations. The predictions in and of themselves don't actually do anything to help. So if there is a prediction, I predict that there's gonna be rain. Okay, so what preparation could I have? I could bring an umbrella, I could reschedule, I could bring my boots, I could, you know, whatever it is. If it doesn't lead to a preparation, then it's just really kind of a, um, it's just, it's an art of, it's a, it's an illusion. I just want, I'm predicting things. And when it's things that I can't do anything about at all, then it's really just the desire to be in control. And I'm not saying it in a mean way. I mean, we all wish we could control world events. I mean, nobody has read one script that I've prepared for them. I can tell you that. So that that's, you know, I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish people were reading my script and following it, but they're not. So instead, I'm going to predict what's going to happen when they don't follow my script and then I'll be right. And how does that make me feel? It makes me feel like I knew it, I knew it. So that somehow is, that's my only thing, but it is a desire to be able to control. But do you think it's also a validation of your experience? If you can say to somebody five years ago, you should have done this and they didn't and it fell apart and you're saying, yeah, it validates. Sure, we'd love to be In a good way. I mean, not not necessarily a negative, more of a we do feel validated, but that's, that's why we get so much pleasure. It makes us feel powerful. I knew it. I knew it. That's what validation is. It makes us feel more powerful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So hard not to do it. Yes. Ella, yes. Ellen, it's Lynn. Lynn. Yeah. A question actually from the very beginning, uh, you said that by Midbar gets translated to numbers. Why? Why in the desert is numbers? numbers. It's because it starts off with the census. It starts off with the numbers of how many people are in each of the tribes. So it goes through by each of the households and it has, you know, starting with the tribe of, of Ruvain, the oldest, then it says they, their count 46,500. And then it goes to Shimon, God, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Ephraim, and it gives the exact count of everybody and then adds them up. So it's basically, it's a census. So that's why it's called numbers. But that doesn't necessarily make sense why it's then it's not numbers in Hebrew. Ah, that's because the numbers was not given by Jews. That's a Christian name. That's no that's not ours. Um, okay. we call it Bamidbar because all of the books of Torah and all of the parshas within each of the books of the Torah get their names from the first from the first significant word in the first sentence of the parsha. So it says, by the bear, Hashem and Moshe, Bamidbar, Sinai. So it's called Bamidbar. Just because we don't usually do by the bear, Moshe, Moshe. So Bamidbar. So it could have been called Sinai. It could have, could have been called Bamidbar Sinai. But that's how we get the names. But the Christians chose it. The church chose it through more content. 
which is why they call Exodus Exodus and we call it Shemot. We call it names and they call it the Exodus because that was like the main event. So they mm -hmm. call it that, but we don't call it that. So it's just kind of interesting. Sure. The one that comes the closest, honestly, is, um, well, to Bereshit um, in the beginning. They call it Genesis. Okay, that counts. And and Deuteronomy, do is the same as Devarim, two is the repetition of the of the um, of the Torah by motion. But Leviticus kind of, but Midmar are not even close. And uh, yeah. So and Shmoke, not really even close. So that's how that gets got got picked. Any other idea, comments, or questions about this? about this speech. So hang on to this. When we think about also, we can also use it as a, um, as our own personal therapeutic approach. Not saying you don't, we don't need professional help because you might, but we don't always need professional help. Some things we can look at ourselves. When we find ourselves doing something in the realm of action, in the realm of Sivan, we can unwind it. <laughs> Excuse me and ask ourselves, not what was I thinking, as in like, I can't believe like, what were you thinking, but what was I thinking that led me to do what I did? And if I was thinking something, it's based on, well, what story was I telling myself that made me think this? Because we're, we don't act randomly, we really don't. We are doing things in some sort of a, there is a method to all of our madness. And so we can also undo and unravel by going backwards in that same equation of taking action. What was, what was I thinking? And what story then was I telling myself that gave me those thoughts? Because they don't appear out of nowhere. Or it could be, it could be an imported story. What story did somebody else tell me that put those thoughts in my head? Okay, so sometimes, you know, people talk about, well, you know, there's tapes running in my head from my parents, my teachers, my whoever. There are words, those are not thoughts, those are words that are going through that create thoughts, that create actions. So we can say, who told me that? You know, who told me that story? Anybody grow up with a story about yourself that, um, took a long time to undo at all. Might be too embarrassing, but if you might have a story, um, some people like uh, even in their family dynamics, where they are in the family, um, you know, in, in my family, my sisters had really beautiful voices and I somehow never got the words right. I don't know. I would come home even from kindergarten and I would like mess up, you know, old McDonald had a farm. I don't know, whatever it was. I, I, I never exactly got it right. And so my mom used to say, and she always wanted us all to feel good. I could be the manager and my sisters would be the performers. Like they'd be the singers and I'd be the manager. So in my head, in my head, I don't sing and my sisters sing and I'm the manager. So can I tell you, it took me years to really get through my head after people paid me money to teach singing and to teach Torah study. I'm like, this is so weird. Like, I'm not the singer. It's like, well, actually, yes, you are. But it did not go with the words that in all innocence, there wasn't anything malicious or anything. It's just the words we hear create thoughts which create actions. And if we wanna undo it, we can unravel it. So it took me a really long time to say, well, actually, I do sing. And actually, people pay me to sing. That's really weird. So, um, and I can also manage. So it's uh, it's amazing. So all of these things, you were told you're, you're, the, this, you're the funny one. You're the person who's always the one who's in trouble. You're the person who's always organized. All these things that we're told, they can be helpful or they can really be very unhelpful. And to get the, the, those words, at least take a look at them and see if they're true. Um, that's the other things because the, when we're young, the people who are in authority over us, they have authority. And so we take what they say very seriously. 
unless we happen to be the rebellious type and whatever you say, I'm going to be the opposite, which means we're also taking it seriously because I'm going to rebel against whatever you tell me. So either way, we take it seriously. So we have all of these voices in our head that have been speaking to us, and then we are reinforcing them, creating the thoughts and then creating the actions until we are just then like on kind of an autopilot. It's like, who is running this show here? It's like all these voices are running my show. So when we come to Pesach and go through Nissan, ER, Sivan, we reevaluate what we are doing, what it is based on, and who said, and I don't mean like, well, who said, but who said, and to say like, I need to like really kind of think this through again for myself. And we are never too young to go through this exercise because we might think, you know, I'm whatever, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. I've been doing it this way for so long. We start to think that is me and it may not be. It may still be those other voices in our heads that are speaking to us and have taken on our voice and are making us do, be, think what we're thinking when it's not really who we really are. So we are coming to the month of Sivan where the Jewish people stand at Mount Sinai and our status is considered as if we have all converted. We are all converting on Shavuot. Not that we weren't Jewish before, but we weren't the Jewish people. We were not obligated. We were not covenanted. We were tribes. We were a family. We were a nation, but we were not the Jewish people in the same way. So think about a, what a person who is a convert and whose story do we read on, on Shavuot? We read the story of Ruth. Talk about somebody who completely undoes and reevaluates who she is and who she actively chooses that she wants to be is Ruth. You go from being a Moabite princess to a Jewish widow who's impoverished and you choose that? Like, who are you? It's like, you are whoever you decide that you want to be. You are whoever you decide you want to be. She's like, I'm not doing that. And even when Ruth, her mother, or even when Naomi, her mother-in-law says, go back, you know, go pick up your story from where you were. You're a Moabite princess, go back to your mom. I'm, I'm nothing, you don't want to be with me. She's like, it says that she, Dafka, she, she, she held, clung to, she clung to Naomi. She was, your God is my God. Your people are my people. Where you, where you go, I will go. I'm with you. I'm basically, I'm rewriting my life and I'm recasting myself as somebody completely different. That's the ultimate act of creativity and it's the ultimate act of self-mastery. That self-mastery is called malchut, kingship, royalty, is the one who gets to decide how things are. And the best thing we can decide how it's going to be, never mind how the rest of the world is, I actually don't get to decide that. What I do get to decide is who I'm going to be. And that's what Ruth does. And she's called the mother of royalty. In fact, that leads to royalty and to King David and ultimately Mashiach. It's like, why of all the different kings, why is it, you know, why does it have to be that? It could have been anybody from the tribe of Yehuda. Anybody from the tribe of Judah could be king. Why would it have to be David? I think coming from Ruth. You know, everybody else, the other kings came from, you know, other people in the tribe of Judah. They kind of inherited it. It's like, okay, it's just kind of like, you know, it's part of the family story. But somebody who remakes themselves and claims her own story, the story she wants, that is ultimately going to be the power of Mashiach. That's going to be the, ultimately the power of the transformation of humanity is going to be to reclaim their story of who they are and not just following, oh, I heard, you know, this is what we do. So it's kind of interesting. On one hand, at the beginning, we started out talking about the power of minhag, the power of your family tradition, the power of those things that we do, that we hang on to when we value and cherish. But just like anything that's good, there's a downside. There may be things that we're hanging on to from our family that are not good. 
that are wrong, just plain out wrong, destructive, incorrect, not meant for us, all those things. And so we actually have to go through a sifting process. Is this a minhag that is helpful, that strengthens my family, strengthens my identity? Or is this something I inherited from conversations growing up that is actually not, maybe it was okay for a while, but it's not really doing me any good now. And I need to get rid of it. And that's a Ruth moment. That is Ruth who is recreating who she, who she is. It's unbelievable. And she starts from absolutely nothing. She unwinds it to the very, very beginning. So I think it's, you know, they're described as like being barefoot. You know, when you're barefoot in the world, you, that means you are, you are down and out. Um, barefoot without shoes is almost like a, a soul without a body. You know, when, um, yeah, without shoes is like a soul without a body. She recreates and reinvents herself. So they talk about this, that people do this after they've had a major setback. You know, think of something maybe in your own life or someone you know. They've had a major financial problem, emotional problem, whatever it might be, addiction problem, something like that. And they're coming back and they need to recreate themselves. And the question is, what is it going to be based on? And it needs to be based on a story of words of who they want to be, which will then generate thoughts, which will then generate the action. And that's how we transform ourselves. So here we are coming into that final month of Sivan, and we're going to come to the sixth of Sivan and have the holiday of Shavuot and receive the Torah, which is our best description of guidelines of how to get this, how to get this life right the first time. Uh, yes, we can be reincarnated, but we're not really looking to do that. The Neshama doesn't really like to have to come back multiple times. It's uh, considered a burdensome thing. Um, so we try to get it right the first time. And hopefully this will be it and we can get it and our own individual journeys and paths will ultimately lead together to the whole world being transformed so if we can stay in the realm of i make preparations rather than predictions i will try to manage what's in my hands to do rather than trying to control and i will think about what are the words and the stories and the messages that i have taken in from wherever from wherever and what thoughts have they led to and what actions have come from that? We'll do like a reverse undoing, rewind the clock and move forward from there. And it's never too late. It says, you know, Ruth was not a young woman, a very, very young woman when she, just, when she recreated herself. And the truth is, is that her mother-in-law, Naomi, was an older woman when she goes back to the land of Israel and she recreates herself as well. So it is always, it is always possible. There's no such thing as, ah, you know, in Hebrew, I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. It's too late. I'm, you know, I'm just going to relax now. It's just too much work. Like not an option. It's not an option. So it doesn't work. So our goal is to be able to stand at Sinai fresh, refreshed, because this whole process is a freshening process. Um, it's like, I don't know, we're having trouble with our computer, which is why I'm downstairs on the laptop. And I know that computers, as they work, as they run, they something happens with how the bits of, I know nothing, I barely know how to turn it on. So I'm just saying these words, I don't even know what they mean. But as you're running it, like bits of whatever information, the way it's stored or something, it kind of clogs things up and you get like all these error messages. And then you, this little message comes on and says like, your computer needs cleaning or whatever. And like, let's clean it and whatever like the longer we've been running the longer we are in our lives not the less we should be doing the more we should be doing of going through this process and shavuot gives us that time to stand refreshed rebooted literally and going through this process so these last few days before we get to shavuot is a time to really look back and say what's really going on, what's really going on with me? Like, why do I do what I do and where did it come from? It's not because I'm crazy. It's not because there's something wrong with me. It's it, that there may be something in the programming that I need to reevaluate and reprogram. And the programming will be done with words. So God willing, we'll be able to do that. And then our actions can transform. Any concluding thoughts, questions, anything else about Shavuos, questions?
Yes, Etta. I was just thinking, so on Shavuos, we're re-accepting the Torah. Correct. We're re-accepting the covenant. Even though this covenant was made without our consent, it was thousands of years ago. So, you know, you might ask, well, how am I obligated to a contract that was made thousands of years ago? But yet, we all feel that strong connection. It's amazing. It's miraculous. It's so, amazing. So do we have to like almost be like a convert and say, do I accept the Torah or do I? Um... Yes and no. Yes and no. So we accept it again. Um, the other thing we have is it says, and I never forget exactly where it's, uh, it Kolchem Hayom says, all of you are standing here today, those who are here and those who are not here. It's like, what does that mean? It says, your neshama was present. It wasn't without your consent. You did consent to it. In fact, not only did anybody who was born Jewish kind of kind of straight through the line, not only did you accept, but that people, says, if you remember the Midrash that says that God took the Torah to the other nations as well and asked them if they wanted it. And none of the other nations did. It says, but what does that mean that God asked them? It says God did ask, but it was a majority rules. So if the nation said no, that doesn't mean that it was a hundred percent said no. Maybe there were three people who said yes. So is any is that fair? Then what if somebody said yes? Their neshama said yes. So so their neshama has the right and will come to the Jewish people through a halacha conversion. They will come and people will say, I always felt Jewish. I felt like I've been like journeying through time. I was just waiting. I was always a little different, something. So we believe that our neshamas were present. And so we are, it's more what we're doing is, I have to say, I always feel like a convert. My middle name is Ruth and I was born around Shavuos. I was born on the 20th of Sivan, but I think the year I was born, no, that's not right. That's not right. It was like Shavuosy time. Uh, it was like around that time. And so I feel, and I wasn't named for Ruth for that reason. My parents didn't, it was for my font, the first letter of my grandmother's maiden name was R and that's how I turned into Ruth. It had nothing to do with Shavuot and yet everything to do with Shavuot. We are really more uh, like when a couple renews their vows. Yes, they've already been married. They're renewing their vows and refreshing their vows. And our coming together at Sinai is really a renewal of vows, of reconfirming. That's why they have the confirmation ceremonies at Shavuos um, in uh, synagogues that do that, um, is because confirmation, those kids are not becoming Jewish at confirmation, they're confirming, theoretically, their connection to the Jewish people, as we all are, as we all are. So we're all there. Thank God we were all there. And hopefully all the people who are meant to come to us will all come to us because they're all meant to be part of our, our picture. It's also interesting that Shavuos is the most blank slate of all of the holidays, which is why we don't even know what to do with it. I remember some, somebody thinking that in our family that Shavuos was a made up holiday because they never even heard of it. It's often after the end of the Hebrew school, Sunday school year, because sometimes it's in June rather than in May. So it's like off the, <laughs> it's off the radar screen completely. And the only thing people associate with it is confirmation class and cheesecake. And it's like, you know, here we had Pesach with matzah, marbor, harosis, Karpas, a Seder, clean your house, do this whole thing, a sukkah is a sukkah, and the lulav and the esrog and dancing is like, and now we have Shavuos. It's like, there's nothing there. So it says, what is that? It's like, well, when there's nothing there, you can say there's either nothing there or there's everything there because it means that there's all potential. It's like, it is what you are going to make of it. It is going to be exactly what you make of it. And so the Shavuos is an opportunity each year to say, and what are you going to make of it this year? It's like, there's no distractions. 
And on some, in some ways, it's harder because it's harder to hang on to. But on the other hand, it's like, you don't have to clean your house. You don't have to build a sukkah. You just have to be there and show up. It literally is like a wedding. It's just saying the relationship is starts again. What's it going to be now? You're renewing your vows. What's the relationship going to be? It'll be up to us to decide how close it will be. So that's why synagogues decorate like a wedding. You know, it's like some people make like a chuppah or have white flowers and make it wedding-like to convey that idea that we are renewing our vows. So that's our goal. You should all mazel tov, have a beautiful wedding and for Shavuos and uh, we should all renew and stand at Sinai as one, one people. And again, we can't stand at Sinai as one people. We can combine all of our learning and I'll get the information to you for our learning and please sign up and watch all those minutes. We had a meeting uh, the other night with the team captains and everybody just put in like what they thought their team might contribute. So as I said, I was kind of high probably on what I thought our team could contribute, but it added just from the people who were there, which wasn't everybody, it added up to 120,000 minutes of just what people were anticipating. And our goal is 180,000. So, you know, another 60,000 added in. It's like when we get the other teams. So please add your voice and add your, your learning to the group and um, watch the, watch the pot fill with minutes. And again, no money, just your time. All right, ladies, thank you so much for joining me. And again, anybody, um, as Lisa announced, anybody who is interested and let's see, um, Leslie, I think you said that you were interested. Okay. And Etta, you're interested also. I'm not positive, Etta, that I have your email address. Do you have mine? Okay, will you send me an email and I'll forward it to Lisa um, Feld so that she can send you an invitation? Leslie, I know yours changed. Do I have the most up to date one for you, Leslie Sharks at? at outlook.com at outlook.com okay i think that's the one i have i've i've yeah. i've been in touch with you successfully right right yes okay all right wonderful all right thank you so much and have a wonderful yentif and i'll thank see you. you in two weeks all thank right you. all right thank, thank you everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Mm -hmm. be well be safe thank you you too thank you ellen ellen yes how do we sign up for the minutes thing to be on your I'm, team? I'm gonna I'm gonna have an, an email sent to you with a link. Oh, okay. Okay. And yeah. then did you just see um Esther and Sel? Said she said she was interested too, and I don't oh, she, know. Oh, okay. I'm not sure so, I have her right down. What I have to do is send it to Shulamis because they send out um uh, the invitation we don't right okay so if you send it to me i'm sure we i can get her um email from from the jewish experience i have a i have a record of it i should be able to get it okay did did she did you let me send you anything did she connect with you or anything okay not that i know of um we're it's coming in we have about 10 10 people so Beautiful. far Great, um, lovely. We're still waiting, but um, hopefully it'll get good. But hopefully we just added three more in who said they were interested. Or maybe, Wonderful. right? Okay. Yes. Leslie. Um, who was the other person that I just Et forgot? Etta. Oh, Etta. right. Leslie, Etta, and Dorothy, are you interested also? Maybe I'd be in, yeah, if Wonderful. I can. Let me just write this down so that I can get everybody. Yeah, I was looking for something too. Leslie, Etta, um, Esther, and Dorothy Resnick. Wonderful. Would you repeat, I was listening to the news about Israel at your first minute or two, um, Ellen? Yes, a class of what you're talking about right now. We're Just talking about an, an immersion circle for the mikvah. For the oh, did you hear Zeldi last night? 
No, uh, I was. So did you I'm get sure. a thing? No, I wasn't. One? I wasn't at that one. Excellent. I mean, I knew she was doing she was it, but excellent. I didn't. Okay. Oh, good. It was excellent. So oh, good. Okay. okay. So you've been to one. So that's <clears throat> great. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I did too. So maybe I've worked. It would be. I went to the one. Already went to one of the mikvah with um, Lori Abramson. Oh yes, this is with Laura. So this is. And was I the speaker for the one you were? Were you at the one for Gabby? Yes. Yes. So. So maybe no. You're welcome to come again. <laughs> it doesn't you. hurt, and you can hear an update because things are really coming along. It's really exciting. Where are you going? To the I'm good, but I'm going to go to Florida for the baby naming of the gal. She was at your class. She says to go to store and they come home to show. So we're doing a baby naming in Miami. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Who are you doing a baby naming for? Um, for Michelle. She's been at your class. She's a, a mommy by choice, a single mom by choice. Oh, nice. And it's going to be in Florida, so I'm, it'll be. So I'm, I'm going to be gone. Oh, well, so lovely. I don't know if I'll get to the. Um, computer or the laptop with the two-year-old right yes but okay. finally we get to have a baby naming babies we love babies That's at the great. synagogue at the synagogue there beautiful very nice all right uh, zelda was great and it, it looks like the tour they gave uh, the virtual tour of what it should look like hopefully it yes. will be really nice plain be simple what they need and very very nice yes thank you ellen all right I, thank you all so much great to see thank you, you. lisa i'll get that information to you dorothy it was great to see you well, thank and you for dorothy, time. and it's nice to see everybody have a good rest of your day and a thank good you. yantif after uh, your class it's always good oh thank you ellen ellen yes yes lisa you, you, you said um do you want the if, by Thursday morning, maybe I can give you like the list that we know who sure. is actually coming. So you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be very helpful. That's fine. Just any time in between before is great. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. All right. All right. Take care. See y'all soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Alan, bye bye. Can yes. you send me an email about the history of the parcel of land that the Arabs are riot rioting about? that the is right do you know it's supposed to be right near the wall and there there are arabs on that land i don't know when they went there do you know oh, you know i it? don't know anything about you it Marcia, i'm sorry okay. all right that's okay we'll figure it out i hope sooner than later okay so. everyone be well thank um, you may be well everybody thank you so much for joining me bye-bye shalom Dorothy, I hear, I, I can say you're talking, but you're on mute.